According to uh, Media Report, Jeep has confirmed that the Cherokee has uh, officially been discontinued. The SUV is one of the brand's most popular models. Let me read that again. The SUV is one of the brand's most popular models and has been in production for 49. They couldn't wait one damn more year. He could have retired with a watch at 50 years, right? But that's why he did it. <laughs> <laughs> damn corporate. This episode of the Jeep Talk Show brought to you by Realtruck.com. With over 1 million parts plus and accessories for your Jeep, truck, and life, Realtruck.com is home to brands like Rugged Ridge, Havoc Off-Road, Infab, Omix, Alloy USA, and more. Check them all out at Realtruck.com. I'm Tony, and welcome to the Jeep Talk Show, the premier show for Jeep enthusiasts and hardcore off-roaders. You know, if you say that enough times, Larry, people will believe it, right? Absolutely. You get <laughs> so whether you're new to the Jeep world or a seasoned Jeeper, we've got you covered with the latest news, tips, and advice to help you get the most out of your Jeep. On tonight's episode, uh, in our news stories, one of our news stories is going to be Jeep Cherokee officially discontinued after 49 years of production. Larry, right. oh my God. <laughs> That's a long run. I hope that's not a, a sign of things to come, you know? And in Fabricating Frenzy, let's talk axles. It's like Axel Rhodes. What is that? Uh, Guns and Roses? Is that uh, who I'm thinking about? Well, not what, not what well, you're planning on talking about, right? <laughs> we, we have to hang around see if I've got a half a shirt on or something. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, <laughs> and then our must-have stuff for your Jeep. Oh, I figured that out, Larry. You know what? It used to be our must-have stuff for your Jeep th or this week for your Jeep. Uh, I realized I could just take out the words this week, and it was fine. <laughs> so, there you go. Because since, you know, since we have two flagship episodes, it's it's all about thinking. You know, you, you have yeah. to think about it, to, to think about it. Anyway, in our must-have stuff for your Jeep, jump starter. Do you have a jump starter? I mean, you got an old Dodge. You must have a jump starter now. Oh, yeah. My Colton Duke. <laughs> <laughs> Are you ready? It's time for the Jeep Talk Show with hosts Tony, Josh, Wendy, and Chuck. Hi, I'm Larry and Bonjour. Bonjourno. What is that? What is it? Be is that like a pizza formal. brand or something? I can't remember. <laughs> it just depends on how you want to say hello. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, did you come back telling your uh, your wife, your loved ones, wee wee? Wee oui, wee, oui, oh yeah. It, well, I mean, I'm 57, so there's a lot of wee wee, right? <laughs> but, <laughs> Have you had your prostate uh, uh, checked yet, uh, Larry? Um, so we're talking about France, right? <laughs> <laughs> not, no. I mean, it's fine. I'm not here to judge. Uh, I was thinking more of it like at a doctor's office, not while you were in yeah. France. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I had mine checked, and I tell you what, you know, it doesn't matter how old you get. <laughs> It's just, you know, you know, it's medical, you know, that it's something that, that needs to happen, but it's just not comfortable. Like, when the doctor asks you if you're enjoying this, you're going a little too much for the checkup. Well, yeah. Well, you, <laughs> you, you've heard the joke, too, where the, the guy says, the doctor says, all right, Steve, <laughs> don't be nervous. Uh, uh, just concentrate. And, and the patient says, my name's Mike. He goes, no, I'm talking to myself. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know how the interview works for that, right? You look for the guy with the smallest hands. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So what's new on hey, Jeep? Jeep Talk Show. This is DR <laughs> too, out too, in too Utah. Late. And uh, I know I haven't called for a while, but I just finished listening up to a bunch of episodes. I've been off for a few weeks with a little back injury, lifting too much, you know. But uh, I was just listening to the episode, just finished 910. And uh, I love AEV, and I, I love looking at everything and dreaming and wishing I could have it. But Matt is an incredible man, and I got a nephew that I think I need to tell him. He needs to go to work for them. He's incredible, too, with Jeeps, loves Jeeps. He's a Cherokee man. He's a hero. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I hope everything's going good out there, and I will talk to you later. 
Yeah, Matt was a uh, Matt at AEV conversions uh, was a, was a fun episode, and you you know Larry, what you can uh, you can tell when you've interviewed somebody enough times, they start feeling comfortable uh, when when they're doing an interview. And I, I liked how he uh, forcefully corrected me that it's not a minus sign on the AEV dash conversions dot com. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> I said, I heard that. Did you hear that? Or is I, hey, that's the name, Matt. You should change that. It's kind of negative. (laughs) So the jokes just write themselves. And, uh, but that was fun. That was uh, fun. Like, uh, how most people say, say it the right way, Tony. It's good. He's comfortable. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. I love that. It's, it's great. uh, Well, it's great podcasting. So, the uh, <laughs> DR on the, your, your, uh, your buddy there with uh, the Cherokee, we have some bad news for you. <laughs> Enjoy that Cherokee. So, uh, Jeep Cherokee officially discontinued after 49 years of project production. Larry, I, I'm a little confused because I think I remember us reporting on the Belvedere plant being closed down. I thought the Cherokee was dead for a while. I guess it wasn't officially dead. They just weren't making it anymore. Yeah, I haven't seen these in the lots for a long time either. No. So, would that also be part of the, the Grand Cherokee as well? Or is it just, just Cherokee? I guess depending on how you look at it, it's either fortunately or unfortunately no. <laughs> because <laughs> they're going to keep making the Grand Cherokees. I know, I know. There's, You know, I don't mind the Grand Cherokee. I just didn't care for, care for it when I was buying my 98 XJ Cherokee. To me, it was too curvy. Uh, and and it's, it's really the same thing that people complain about the, the XJ. Uh, they say that's, you know, that's, that's not really a G. Jeep. It's not a Wrangler. Uh, that was your only choice back then uh, in 98 when I got that XJ. And uh, it, it was a little too boxy, a little too, well, not, I guess no Jeep can be too boxy, uh, a little too curvy, a little too much like a grocery getter. And uh, I mean, hell, it didn't even have a frame, uh, a, a, a solid frame to it. It was all unibody. Right. So yeah, that, I guess that's the whole, that's the whole thing about it though, right? Because everybody wants the bigger SUVs now. And since you know, I don't think that even has a solid front axle in it anymore, does it? Oh no, they're IFS. Yeah, I mean, right. uh, and I think the I, I believe the Grand Cherokees are all IFS now. Now, back, at least back whenever I was uh, not wanting a Grand Cherokee uh, when I was buying my first Jeep, uh, they were solid front axles. I think I think the Grand Cherokees up until I don't know. Uh, I would, I'm going to uh, venture a guess it was well into the 2000s, in the 21st century, before they went with IFS. You know, IFS just feels so good. It just feels like luxury. I, that's why the Bronco has uh, IFS. Well, I'm going to probably upset some people, but so it's pretty much just like a Compass L. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, for all intents and purposes, it's got the seven slots in the front. I mean, God, I hope it still has seven slots. Yeah. Uh, looking at the picture that we have in our show notes, and, and you'll be able to see this, uh, everything that we're looking at uh, uh, in our show notes. You can see that on our website, jeeptalkshow.com. Just go over to episode 916, and you will see this. And a big shout out to uh, Chris of uh, sevenslats.com for maintaining our uh, flagship episode uh, show notes. So uh, when you see Chris, tell him thank you for keeping those show notes up to date. No, it does a good job. So Jeep, though, will continue to sell the SUV's larger sibling, the Grand Cherokee. See, Larry, it's right there. There you go. Uh, no need to worry. I, I I can't help but think that parts. Uh, what do you call those people behind the counter? The the service uh, service not service managers. The parts people. You know where you go up and you tell them you want a part, and they want to know yep. what what kind of vehicle it is. Um, I mean, uh, at least there's hope in the future that people will walk up to the counter and say Cherokee, or maybe they'll actually say Grand Cherokee, and the parts guy won't have to say, "Is that a Cherokee or a Grand?" Because, you know, parts, gonna, all, all parts people talk like that. <laughs> they're going to ask you for the last six of the VIN. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, gee, that's the, uh, this is why I like I need, ordering online. <laughs> yeah, I need a spark plug. I need the last six of the VIN. You Windshield know wiper. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Do you guys sell a sticker? Oh, how about one of those uh, those little pine trees I can hang from my, my mirror? Well, I need a VIN for that mirror. Make sure it'll fit. <laughs> exactly. Well, it's kind of nice to know that they're not killing all the Cherokees. You know, I still want a Trackhawk. Yeah. 
Yeah. No, the, the, there's absolutely nothing wrong with a Grand Cherokee, but uh, from from an off-road standpoint, and I'm going to get some hate from the, the ZJ owners and the WJ owners, oh, yeah. uh, but from an off-road standpoint, it, there's uh, to me, there's a lot um, better choices uh, for off-road. Now, I, I will tell you that you can modify the hell out of anything and take it off-road, and it will be the best thing. Hell, I've seen a solid axle uh, uh, put on a, uh, I don't know the two-letter designator, the uh, the Liberty. You know, the first Liberties that came out that were very reminiscent of a VW Beetle? <laughs> I've seen those things. I think they literally just took the body off of the thing and put it on a frame for, for something else that it would fit to. But they probably just had uh, ratchet straps holding it down, too. But anyway. Send, send your hate mail to Tony at the Jeep <laughs> no, Talk no, Show. No, 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 <laughs> Nikki G at the at the 10 minute off road podcast. <laughs> That'd be funny if he started getting mail from uh, <laughs> Jeep, Jeep Talk Show related stuff. What the hell? We'd, we'd hear some, uh, some voicemails about that. Anyway, uh, according to a uh, media report, Jeep has confirmed that the Cherokee has uh, officially been discontinued. The SUV is one of the brand's most popular models. Let me read that again. The SUV is one of the brand's most popular models and has been in production for 49. They couldn't wait one damn more year. He could have retired with a watch at 50 years, right? That's why I did it. (laughs) (laughs) Damn, corporate. So, uh, Jeep started production on the Cherokee in 1974 as a two-door SUV based on the brand's Wagoneer model. The SUV switched to a unibody platform in 1984. That's the the Cherokee that I know, uh, becoming a smash hit with over 3 million sold. The Cherokee was manufactured in the U.S. of A. until 2001, after which its license-built versions were made in China until 2014. Wow. Could you imagine having a 2014 uh, Cherokee? And, uh, I, and when, they, when I say a, a Cherokee, I think that the, 20, the Chinese uh, Cherokee was, I'm not going to say it was an XJ, but it was much more XJ-ish than the, the new uh, Cherokees that came out around 2012 or whatever. I don't know, that sounds like something you ordered for dinner, the Chinese Cherokee. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, I want some Kung Pao with that, please. So, uh, extra MSG. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was, uh, the, 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 that would be pretty cool. I, I seem to remember the, the front end looked a little different. The headlights were not the, the, the standard headlights that we're used to seeing on XJs. So, reports state that the Cherokee served as a template for most modern unibody SUVs and helped popularize the body style. I firmly believe this because, it, I, I mean, Ford, what was it? The Ford Explorer came out and uh, it was very um, uh, XJ-ish. I don't know, like saying Cherokee because uh, a, a lot of people think of the Cherokee as the, the modern day Cherokee. And, and to me, like I've always said, it, it, and I, I think a lot of people don't understand it, it looks like a Reebok tennis shoe to me. It's just, it, yeah. it, it's not... It's not groundbreaking. It's not doing its own thing. It's just a copy of the the standard crossover vehicles, which was really one of the things that I really disliked about it. Well, honestly, I'll just mention this again for the 15,000th time. I was pissed off about it because I love my XJ, and I was really hoping that they would do something that was a a tribute, a modern-day tribute to the old XJ. And it wasn't. It was just a sack of shit looking thing that was just like every other uh, crossover out, that looked out, out there. It wasn't setting the trend like the XJ did. Well, I would kind of like to see what the Chinese spec is, see what they changed, because you know they had to change some things on that. And I just can't imagine, you know, a Cherokee rolling down the middle of China with a four liter and everything else on it. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, I don't know. I, I do remember the headlights were different, and I do remember that you could order those headlights if you wanted to give a, a more modern-day look. Um, I mean, I say that you shouldn't change a classic, but I guarantee you, if I had an MJ, which is basically a, a, a Jeep Cherokee XJ truck, and uh, I had a donor vehicle uh, from like a 97 plus, I'd pull all that 97 stuff, even the dash and the interior that, uh, cause you can swap all that stuff over, uh, in the MJ and have me a 97 plus, uh, MJ. 
Uh, it would look just like a, a more modern day Jeep. And I say more than the one that they ended making in 2001. Good Lord, 22 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, it, I just I, I really have always liked the MJ. And I think it was probably because it was uh, like it, it's a Cherokee that has a bed. Which is very reminiscent of what I've got, which is a, a a Wrangler, a JL Wrangler with a bed, which they call a Jeep truck, a JT. So it'd be really cool to have uh, have a MJ and a JT both. Yeah, I'm looking at. Uh, so I had to look it up while you were talking. Oh, good. Yeah, looks like he's got five slots. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> it's that's so silly but you see what i mean about the headlights aren't they like these uh yeah. huge wraparound ford uh, truck type looking uh oh, exactly. headlights yeah it doesn't look like a traditional xj big square headlight it's it wraps around more well oh, the body the rest of the body looks very similar but yeah it's a that's probably a, a huge luxury vehicle there it's you know with all the people in china I wonder if they have buffets, Chinese food buffets in China. <laughs> maybe they have well, American. Yeah, kind of a, maybe they have American food buffets. That would be, and you go over there and grab a bunch of hamburgers and stuff. <laughs> 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 All right, so uh, yeah, so anyway, Stellantis, which owns the Jeep brand, uh, idled the Illinois plant uh, where the Cherokee was being made. A spokesman. A spokesperson uh, from Stellantis also confirmed that uh, while Jeep will have a presence in the midsize SUV segment, the new model might uh, not bear the Cherokee name. You know, well, you know, they they have had some problems, uh, and I think most of the problems were not with Indians, but with the the people that are trying to help the Indians. You know, because it's it's always fun to bitch about something uh, about using the Cherokee name, which is obviously a a name that was inspired by a, a tribe of Indi- Indians from uh, from North America. Uh, I, and I may be wrong on this, but I don't think any uh, Indian publicly. Uh, complained about it, uh, but so this might be their way of getting rid of that uh, that name without seeming. Um, uh, I don't I don't want to yeah. say girlish, but you know what I mean. Like the, right, you know, not uh, confronting it head on. Like we're we're doing away with this because we don't want to offend uh, a race of people. Yeah, I was trying to figure. It. Remember the uh, senator's name from up east? Maybe she complained, but. That's a whole nother discussion. Mm-hmm. So uh, Jeep, though, will continue to sell the SUV's larger sibling, uh, which we already mentioned, the Grand Cherokee, which will carry uh, forward the name for now. Oh, that's a good point. They're going to continue uh, using the the name Cherokee, but now they're just going to it's going to make everybody, everybody feel better because it's grand. It's you know, I think uh, I, I remember doing a, a a photo chop a long time ago uh, with uh, the Grand Cherokee uh, wheeling over a. Uh, 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 an open biscuit can of the the grand biscuits you remember the grand biscuits oh yeah i love those things the flaky the buttery oh they're just wonderful uh but uh, yeah so the uh so where is the and i don't know this i'm kind of posing a question here the compass and the liberty are those all out of production now um, I'm not sure. Uh, understandably, I think I don't follow those very, no, exactly. very much. I, I don't follow um, them either. But I do believe there is a uh, thinking back to a, a prior uh, episode. I do believe there are plans on the books for 2025 uh, for the um, was it the Liberty, not the Liberty. Um, I can't remember now, but anyway, in the concept vehicle drawing, which I don't think has is anything Jeep has released, it looked very Jeepy. It looked a lot more like a Cherokee than uh, the the actual the modern day Cherokee looked like. And I was a little disappointed whenever I figured out that that was just a, a concept and not, and not from Jeep. So there's no telling what it's going to look like. But of course, it was all electric. Oh, there you go. That's how they got to get you. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, uh, what do you, what do you guys think? Is it uh, is forty nine years just really sad? I mean, I was really sad when they uh, stopped making the XJ, uh, the the Jeep Cherokee from nineteen eighty four through two thousand one, and uh, personally, I really dis- despised the Liberty because that was really the replacement for the XJ, and it, it was just a total crap vehicle, uh, in my opinion. We'll just wait around for a little little ways, right? So they'll, they'll rehash that name and start building it in some other form in a few years. 
Wouldn't it be That's, wonderful? Wouldn't it be wonderful though? Even if it was all electric, if they if they came out with a Cherokee that was very is a a modern like a resto mod uh, almost, but with some modernizations uh, of the of the XJ, that would be really cool. Oh yeah. And like I said, even if it was all electric, which I despise. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's fine if you if you can get five hundred, a thousand, or hell, like an aircraft carrier. You put the fuel in it, and it just goes for twenty years. <laughs> that would be really, really cool. I could do electric if I didn't have to put fuel in it. Well, could you imagine going and getting in a vehicle that had a twenty year lifespan for uh, power, and then you go out there and it it won't go. What do you do? What do you check? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. does it turn over? No, it hasn't. It doesn't. It's not built to turn over. It, just, it doesn't hum. No. <laughs> just give me the last six of the vent, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, they even have vents. It'll if Apple ever uh, makes a car, it's going to have uh, one number for the vent, kind of like their one button solution. Yeah, I can't imagine it. it. Although I gotta admit it, it might be cool. Electric motors and a three ninety two all tied together. That could be fun. Yeah, it would be, wouldn't it? <laughs> all right. Well, I found this next story kind of refreshing, although it's not. Mm, it's not a hundred percent the Jeep Talk Show uh, thought process here, or how we feel about it. Stellantis CEO complains about being forced to make EVs and not knowing how to profit from them. <laughs> <laughs> seems to be a problem with most of them <laughs> well i think uh it, gosh and it seems like it changes it kind of go keeps going up i guess maybe the uaw strike is part of this but uh ford making that f-150 lightning which apparently is a is a really nice truck uh but they they lose i think the last i heard is they lose sixty thousand dollars when they sell no, one i heard Huh? Yeah. Number number I heard. Good, you. good, good. It's like good. Sixty grand. It, it's co- it, that's proper journalism. We've confirmed the story. <laughs> <laughs> Back check. That's right. So Stellantis CEO Carlos Taveras uh, made some interesting comments that, uh, and, and this guy, it's going to be funny if he if he winds up uh, in harm's way or something because of this, because we all know that the big push for EVs is coming straight from our government. Uh, But anyway, uh, he made some interesting comments that amounted to claiming that electric vehicles are being imposed on them. This is this is huge, Larry, because this is the uh, the guy in charge of not only Jeep, but the the whole Stellantis brand uh, saying what many of us have been saying for a while now. Yeah, well, the government doesn't have to produce a product, make sense or any of the above. Right. They just have to impose their will and. uh Try to see if anybody else will will go along with it. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly why we don't need lawyers and uh, uh, career politicians running this country. We need businessmen running this country. Although, uh, and I know it's just a movie, but you can always look back at uh, RoboCop and go, well, I don't know if I'd want a a businessman running this company. I mean, this country or not, especially looking at how the police force was, uh, was handled by the private sector. You know, short short term politicians what you need uh, yeah i i agree and that's uh, and that's absolutely all of them not just one party the, the i mean you can't do that i mean <laughs> actually i'm sure that one of the parties would try but uh, i i think they all should have uh, limited time in office their their point for being in office should be to uh, for the betterment betterment of the united states uh but anyway he says, uh, finishing the sentence, uh, the vehicles are being imposed on them and they don't know how to make them profitable. Um, I wonder, I guess you can't hire uh, Elon uh, because he's already a multi-billionaire, but uh, apparently Elon has some ideas on how to make them profitable. Um, so I want to throw something out there, Larry. Maybe this has crossed your mind. Maybe I'm way off base on this. And, and, and listener, you feel free to correct me if you think I'm wrong. I am kind of concerned that the the whole reason for the UAW strike uh, has to do with hurting uh, companies that are making the ICE vehicles, the internal combustion engines. What do you think, Larry? Could it be a government um, conspiracy to actually uh, cause these uh, these big businesses to go out of business? Do you think the government would do something like that? That'd be a lot of people out of work. 
Well, I wouldn't put it past them, but I don't know that that's this one. I, I think this one is strictly internal with the with the employees themselves. I think the government's push to put them out of business is the electric mandate. That's a whole separate push. Right. But I mean, if, if the company like Ford, for example, if Ford uh, isn't moving forward with uh, doing all electric vehicles, if they're continuing to do the internal combustion engine vehicles, you know, the ones that they make profit on. <laughs> yeah. The novelty. <laughs> and, and, and the profit that they need to be able to pay the workers. Uh, so uh, I'm thinking that if you can't, um, you know, I'm actually thinking that the government is causing, they don't care about the, the people losing their jobs. They're just making use of them so that they can shut down these companies so that we can focus on electric vehicles because, you know, we need to, to, to handle everything that's green. Uh, it, everything needs to be green. And if, if people get hurt, we don't care as long as the, the, the planet is green. Well, I just think this will end up like most things, right? They make the uh, they make the announcements, have all the press conferences, and those are always front page. And in a few years, on page thirty five, the retraction that's where that sits, mm -hmm. right? Because that's because that's not as popular. Well, it'll come you just it'll be buried somewhere. Yeah, and I think this is the start of it with the Stellantis CEO actually uh, saying something about it. I mean, that's a big deal, and that's kind of what they've been trying to do. Uh, and, 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 I'm, and I'm not trying to point at one political party. It's just government in general. Uh, they're making use of uh, social media. And before that, it was uh, uh, radio and TV uh, to uh, mold the, uh, the public's perception and what you could and couldn't say. And uh, I just wonder, I mean, I know it's out there uh, and it would be a, be a hell of a thing. But we're, we're seeing things come to light that I thought would never be true. Uh, that uh, our government agencies, our alphabet agencies, uh, really seem to be doing some things to us instead of uh, the, uh, the the not us. Uh, right. and maybe they're doing it to the not us too. I don't know. Maybe they're treating us all the same. So what? Do, so what do you think that at its core the big difference there is? You know, we have a Tesla whose really whole business model was was pointed right at electric vehicles from the very beginning. And then you have everybody else who's trying to do both, right? So is it the streamlining of just focusing on the electric and not being bothered by everything else? The reason why Elon's been able to make money? I think Elon is making money because he thinks in a way of how can we make less parts? How can we make one big part? Uh, what do we need to make that one big part uh, and, and not have to do a lot of work putting uh, multiple parts together. Uh, and, and from, his, from the, the, the SpaceX thing, it's like the best part is no part. So the less parts you have, the, more, uh, the cheaper it can be made, uh, relatively speaking. I mean, there's always situations sure. where you could overly complex something just trying to make it simple. Um, that's a great statement. Uh, but uh, I, I think it is. It's just a it's one man with a vision and he's controlling uh, what the the overall um, goal is. And I think that in these bigger companies, you wind up with a bunch of people making decisions, power struggles. And uh, and I'll just say it. I mean, uh, I think that having to pay. Uh, uh, people, what a, um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm brain farting. What's the UAW? The um, what's, union wage? Yeah, the union workers. I think that whenever you have something, and, and it's actually wonderful for the workers, but for the company making money and trying to make something uh, inexpensively for the masses, I think it's counterintuitive to that happening because uh, they do not have union workers uh, at Tesla. I mean, you guys correct me on that if I'm wrong, but they don't have unions. So, well, uh, so, so maybe we need a call in, right? So maybe we need someone to call in from the Tesla and kind of give us what the the normal average wage is on the line versus a, uh, I'll, I'll say a, G, a GM or a Chevy or a Ford. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. I mean, I, I love the idea of people being paid a good wage, uh, but uh, at the same time, I don't know that I want to spend $100,000 on a vehicle. Yeah, because then you also got to ask, too, is, you know, with that statement, you get Rivian out there who is 100% dedicated to electric only, 
And from what I'm hearing, they're not making it either. No, no, they're not. Uh, I think uh, Tesla and uh, one Chinese company, I think, are the only two companies that are making a profit. And Tesla is the only one that's making, uh, and I, I don't know the percentage, but what I've heard is good profit. So, um, yeah, I mean, and that's kind of the surprising thing. Uh, uh, you would think that it would be fairly simple just to get a Tesla, buy a Tesla, take it apart, figure out what they're doing, and, uh, and basically copy it and do it the same thing uh, they're doing with your own design, of course, because you don't want to get sued. But see where the innovations are, see where the cost savings are. But, but then again, uh, it, it seems to me that uh, uh, Elon does a lot of stuff. Uh, he takes it all in-house. They make their own batteries. They make their own this. They make their own that. Uh, I'm surprised they're not making tires. So uh, they can find uh, additional ways of cost savings. Whereas, uh, well, let's, let's talk about the computers that are in the modern day vehicles. It's those computers, those modules and in, in vehicles, modern day vehicles are full of multiple computerized modules. Well, those modules come from third party uh, manufacturers. And, and right. the, one of the things is they talk about Tesla is how can Tesla do over the air updates of their vehicle? Well, it's their silicon chips. <laughs> it's their computer. It's their code. <laughs> so they know how the thing works. And they don't have to worry about interfacing with some third-party manufacturer. Now, again, I love third-party third party manufacturers. Oh, and there's another cost savings too, isn't it? Because now you have to arbitrate with that third-party manufacturer how much you're going to pay for that computer module. Right. And, and they got they have to have money to pay their people. It, you know, it, you remember whenever the internet came out and the, 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 the song, the illegal music sharing started? And then it, it, oh, yeah. it morphed. Napster. Yeah. It, exactly. It morphed, and then uh, a lot of the middlemen went away, and then there was these uh, uh, music uh, musical stars that came about where they were just selling pe uh, their music straight to the, the end user. Well, that's what Tesla's doing. They're selling their cars straight to the end user, and they haven't even been doing uh, you know, like paid advertising. I mean, people talk about them all the time. Uh, Adam Sandler, I remember, bought a Tesla years ago and bought a, all, all of his friends a Tesla. So there's that kind of advertising. But they're only now thinking about doing uh, actual radio and TV advertising for the Teslas. What are the odds that that Chinese company making electric cars or they're making electric Cherokees? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> now we're talking. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't mean to talk a whole bunch about Tesla, but I've been watching a lot. I am. Uh, I do own stock uh, in Tesla. And uh, yeah, it's been taking a beating here recently, but I don't care because, uh, my God, the stuff that they're doing is just absolutely amazing. And uh, I, I think that what you're going to see, uh, especially with the full self-driving, uh, which I don't know if you guys are aware of or not. I've mentioned this before. Uh, this stuff is amazing. The full self-driving is amazing. And it is going to transform how we do, how we drive around. Now, it ain't going to take us off-road. And that's why we need to do everything we can do to keep the Jeep going <laughs> so we don't lose that. I don't see Tesla ever building something that's uh, comparable to a Jeep. And uh, I've heard good things uh, about the Rivian and, and really heard it from Wendy uh, about it doing uh, good things off-road. But I, I don't believe you're ever going to see a vehicle that's better than a Jeep off-road. No, not at all. Yeah. So anyway, it's good to see that uh, uh, one of these uh, car company CEOs is speaking out and uh, at least in some way uh, agreeing with the Jeep talk show, which is always a good thing to do. I think that's a safe <laughs> bet, Larry. <laughs> always. <laughs> hey, good evening, Jeep talk show. This is Steve-O from Aurora, Illinois. Wanted to talk to everyone and remind them about our Discord server. If you ever have any questions about a Jeep project, People there are always willing to help. I recently came across a struggle trying to determine which axle I had as I was changing my mm -hmm. differential cover, and the fluid is different depending on which model axle according to the owner's manual. Got very confusing, so brought up in the chat and Discord, and one of the members, uh, Larry, very knowledgeable, Jeep and Mo, said, hey, what's on the build sheet? Of course, I didn't have the build sheet because I bought it pre-certified and what's it was the no longer there. <laughs> so, <laughs> off I went and did a Google search, and I was able to enter my VIN and get my build sheet. 
found exactly which model rear uh, differential I have. I have the 220 uh, axle, so I was able to get the right fluid. So there's actually two different fluids listed in the owner's manual. So become part of the uh, Discord channel. It's free. There's no involvement. Yeah, there's some uh, shenanigans going on, but if you ever have a serious question, everybody is there to help. And if you do submerge your Jeep, <laughs> you won't get a little tongue in cheek. That's pointed. Good, uh, he, good won't, faith he won't let go of that. <laughs> Poor Rick. Peace out. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, the Discord server is uh, is a lot of fun, and uh, I don't mention it enough here. I, uh, I I've got that same problem most people have. You don't want to repeat yourself a lot uh, because uh, you don't want people rolling your, rolling their eyes. But we have new listeners all the time, Larry. So I, I really have to do a, a better job in reminding people about all the fantastic things that we have uh, to, that gets Jeep, Jeepers together. And uh, of course, we're always thinking of more things. But uh, it's so simple to get on the Discord server. Just go to jeeptalkshow.com slash contact and you will see a link there, which is uh, what they call an invite uh, that you can click and uh, you just pick a name and boom, you're there. Uh, I did an interview recently uh, and uh, was telling the, uh, the the guest that was on, hey, you know, you ought to come over there and you can talk about your uh, the, the Jeep parts that you have and uh, just enjoy the conversation. And he joined us today. So. Uh, it's it's great, and we have a we have a really good group there, and it's it's often the very same group that you see uh, in the the Zoom meeting uh, for our roundtable episode. Yeah, it's it's a great little community. The one thing I'll I'll advise that when you're in there, don't try to keep up. Just go with what you see. Don't try to go back because there's a lot of people chatting in there, and uh, there's a lot of good information. Yeah, I remember that was one of the things that uh, Don was saying that he. Uh, <laughs> He would find himself going back pages, trying to oh, yeah. figure out where the conversation was. Nah, just just jump on the bus as it drives by. <laughs> just like at a campfire, just, just start where you're at. Oh, and don't think it's broken whenever you get there and there's nothing going on, because there are periods of time where uh, there's there's not much being said. Uh, and then, then there's those times where you, you get there and you go, holy crap, what <laughs> happened? Everybody what blew up? I woke up. <laughs> So the topic of overlanding, where explorers travel an extended distance remotely over terrain, has become one of the most notable trends in off-road and automotive 4x4 culture over the past half decade. Yeah, Larry, do you overland? Do you, take, do you go someplace with a sandwich? Because that's what you got to do for overlanding. Every now and then. <laughs> overlanding can take a few days to a few weeks to accomplish, but the principal goal in overlanding is the journey and being able to enjoy it. Having a great plan uh, can help make your journey more enjoyable. And with that, Realtruck.com recently published their very own Wrangler Overland Guide on Real Source. The Overland Trim Overview discussed not only the factory trim level, but ways to turn your plain Wrangler into an all-out Overlander using parts from Real Truck's catalog of manufacturers like Superlift, Havoc Off-Road, Rugged Ridge, and more. Click the link in today's show notes or head over to realtruck.com slash blog for the complete compendium of real source titles. Welcome to Fabricating Frenzy with Larry, also known as Jeeping Mo, whose hair is not curly. All right, everyone. So let's talk a little, little bit about the axles in your JL and your JT. And it was actually a conversation that we heard in the voicemail from Steve-O that kind of drove this segment a little it, bit. Isn't that because, cool how that worked out? I thought that was pretty cool because I knew what was coming. <laughs> yeah. And I didn't I didn't post the, uh, the topic I was going to talk about until just uh, a little bit ago. But let's talk about the axles in your JL and your JT. Now, if we look at the uh, the lineup on what axles are being offered, one thing they did a little different on a JL and JT is what you would normally call a Dana 30 and a Dana 44 axle. Now they're identified with an M designate, whether you have the M186, M200, or M220. And new configuration refers to the ring size in millimeters. So the M186 is the 7.2, I'm sorry, 7.32. M200 is a 7.87 ring, and an M220 is an 8.66. And that's typically what's in all your Rubicons, 
and uh, your JTs and all those. But so when you hear M, think ring size. So there are many different configurations of these axles for a Wrangler. Now, for the information, that was a little bit hard to find. I searched all over Jeep's website, and most of it came out of forums. It's, so, isn't that strange? I've had the same issue. Uh, for example, um, the the front axle on my JT is an M210. Yes. Yeah, and you would think that you could go right out to to the Jeep website and, and just get a list of all the available axles or... Yeah in the build sheet or something, but the, I, I literally had to dig it all out of forums. So I'll give them a little credit to the, to the people who run on a lot of these forums. So let's talk about the Rubicon model. Now it has a, a Dana M210 axle in the front and an M220 axle in the rear. Unlike any of the other JL models, these axles all measure 68 inches wide, making a inch and a half wider than a sport and an I always want to call the Sierra, the Sahara. <laughs> you got the same problem I have. <laughs> oh, yeah. They, they get me all the time in the Discord room. <laughs> and it's two and a half inches wider than the models that came in a JK. Oh, my goodness. I had no idea. Yeah, I, I was a little shocked by that also when I seen that number. I didn't think they were that much wider, but, you know, they, they are. Mm-hmm. And let me let me just yeah. let me just add real quick that uh, okay. the uh, the Sport and Sport S uh, gladiators uh, are available uh, for Max Tow package, and the Max Tow package is the M two ten and the M two twenty. So yes. um, if you, you can if you have a Sport gladiator model, uh, and if you bought it if you bought it used, it's always possible. Uh, that it has the max toe, and that the, the, the axles is one of the things that are uh, more better. Uh, there's a, I think an alternator is a 250 amp alternator, and yada yada. But uh, yeah, uh, so I, I know this because it's I went through all this when I was looking at the, getting the Gladiator. Well, yeah, that that and a thicker a uh, thicker tube. Yep, it's well, it's the Rubicon axles uh, with minus the lockers. Right. So the, the regular sports come with the Dana M186 front and uh, Dana M200 and for the rear. Now, just like the Sahara, these axles Sierra. only measure Sierra, Sahara, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> they only measure 66 and a half inches. You know, you're going to really screw me up now, right? <laughs> I know. That's what I was going for. <laughs> so, the Sahara. Sahara. <laughs> no. Damn it, Tony. <laughs> so the Sahara and the Sport are available with the Dana N220 rear axle, which comes as part of a limited slip differential. Now, that's where what, what Steve was talking about. That limited slip will take a, a friction modifier also. So that's where the different lube comes in. Because I couldn't initially find why they would change the lube in the... Uh, in, in the axles, and then when it popped oh, up, that it had the course. limited slip differential. Yeah, you have to have, like, that, friction modifiers and stuff in there. Right. Yeah, because if you remember, right, the old posi track rear ends from, you know, ye years ago, that was always, you had to install the friction modifier after you put the fluid in. My uh, Chrysler 8 and a quarter in the XJ uh, had a limited slip in the back of it. Uh, and, of course, it has a locker in there now. A really good uh, non-limited slip. Uh, but, yeah, I, I remember learning about friction modifiers and the fluid way back then. Of course, by the time I changed the fluid, uh, the, I'm sure that limited slip was a was a permanent slip. Yeah, and that was something that we talked about, not to go off on a tangent, but we talked a few shows back about the transfer case in, uh, like, the 392s and some others who have clutch packs in them. Whether or not that took a friction modifier, that's something we still haven't found out yet. Mm -hmm. I bet you it does. I bet it does, too. But don't put it in yet. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. The Jeep oh, Talk so, Show told me. <laughs> yeah. And your hate mail, too. <laughs> Nikki G. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So for the Gladiator, there's not as many axles used. So the similar, the M186 is not part of the lineup. And I don't think anybody's upset by that. Oh one. God, no! I would. I think the <laughs> Wrangler owners would love to have the Dana Forty Four in the front on all the oh, models. Absolutely. 
And for the most part, all the JTs get the M210 front axle. Now, if you're uh, if you get the sport model, you get the M220 with the standard tubes. But if you get the Sport S with the Max Toe, the Rubicon, the Mojave, and the high altitude, you have thicker tubed, thicker tube 10 millimeter wall uh, axles, and they're inch and a half uh, wide. So I, I got to look at that. It's inch and a half wide track axle. So I guess they're inch and a half wider mm -hmm. yeah, than that's standard. What it is. Yeah. Now the Rubicon and the Mojave have rear lockers in them. The Rubicon is still the only version that has lockers front and rear. And the uh, high altitude, it's, it was listed that it has the uh, the track lock rear diff. Well, I'm assuming that's probably your uh, limited slip. Probably so. I think that's what mine says. Yeah, I tried to find it. I was I was all over the site, and there's so little information out there. So the one thing I did find, though, that the uh, M220 that's in the JT is not the same as the M220 that's in the JL. See, that's just pissing me off. <laughs> right? It's there's a number yeah. there. They're the same. <laughs> they are the same, but you know that's and you know how we know that because the the rear the control arm skids that I build and I build them specifically for the uh, the Wrangler 220 when I sent you that set oh, that's right I was shocked they did that, that didn't fit and that's when I did a little more research your control arm mounts and your shock mounts are different on the the JT 220 mm -hmm. versus the the Wrangler 220 put a letter or something on that in like an m220 JT or uh, M O U S C or anything that the differentiate it. Yeah. Yeah. But there's, there's definitely some differences. Now, one thing I couldn't find much on, and I have to assume there's probably some difference with the, the four by E rear axles. There really was not much information because they, they referenced things like, uh, true spin rear ends. I kept finding stuff like that, which I assume was probably the track locks or the limited slip. So I think for the most part, I think that they're the standard axles, but, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll put the disclaimer out there. I could not find anything that says that they're the same or they're different. So if you have a 4xE and you've had it apart, give us a call and let us know if your 4xE Dana 44 M220 rear axle is any different mm -hmm. now i'll say we've been trying to get dana i mean i literally talked to somebody out at ejs this year uh that works for dana and we've really been trying to get them on the show and i guarantee you i'd be asking them questions about this stuff because i would oh, love to hear directly from the manufacturer all about these numbers and also to give them a little give them a little chatter about the uh why is the m220 one thing for one vehicle and the m220 is a different thing for another vehicle then they're both jeeps uh, I mean, it's fine. I'm, I'm sure there's a reason, but I'd like to understand it. Right. And, you know, that's the interesting thing. If you go to Dana Direct, they have all the high-end axles there. So, you know, if you're wanting like, a, you know, the big Dana 60 rear ends, the front ends, and all of those, you can get all that factory from Dana as well. It does. You don't have to go to some of the other, not if there's anything wrong with any of the other brands, but... If you want to stick with a Dana, you can buy direct and, and get all the high-end axles you get everywhere else as well. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion on the Dana axles? I love Dana axles. I mean, to me, that's that's what the axles are, uh, the, what axles should be. Uh, is, the, is there any reason to go with something other than Dana? I mean, unless you're a monster truck or a, a, a bouncing buggy or something? Yeah, I would think. So for me... I would say for an average Jeep, I think they're perfect. If you're wanting to go high horsepower, like you said, a buggy, I mean, if I'm wanting to run 40 spline axles and, you know, or if I want to go with a, you know, a really high pinion, then, you know, you're going to have to move out of that and get into more of a special configuration. But, you know, for me, I, I think they work quite well. I mean, you can wheel the world on Dana 44s, right? I mean, if a Dana 44 won't do it, a Dana 60 will. Yeah, as long I would say, I, and this is just me. I know I'm gonna hate mail over this. For me, Dana 44 kind of stops at a 35 inch tall tire. I think if you're wanting to get, you can run 37s if you put the chromoly shafts and everything in them. But if you're wanting to run 40s, those are Dana 60s all day long. Mm. 
Yeah, I mean, it always changes, especially whenever you articulate it. But I can't imagine sure. running more than thirty sevens. Um, yeah, you know what I mean. What I mean, but uh, that this is like you know, thirty uh, fives are the new thirty threes, and yeah, thirty sevens are the new thirty fives, and then you you just keep it, going. <laughs> yeah, and it really depends how you wheel, right? Because you know the two of the teammates we wheel with a lot. You know, John and, and Bill, they run 37s under Dana 44s, and it's they really don't have much issues. But if you have a more aggressive wheeling style, I don't think that axle is going to hang around long. Mm, interesting. Well, it's going to hang around a lot longer than a Dana 30 of any <laughs> any well, year. <laughs> well, you know, that's, that's one thing interesting since you bring that up. So when I pulled a Dana 30 out of the front of mine and I put the 44 in it, at least on the newer model, the knuckles, all of that assembly are exactly the same. Yeah. So everything from the, the everything in the you know the C and all of that, all of that's the same for the new Dana thirty and the new Dana forty four. Obviously, the center section and all that's different, but everything out by the wheel, pretty much the same. Very good. Very interesting. Uh, sorry, I interrupted it and told you stuff that you were going to cover later in your uh, your segment, but eh, oh, people, it's all good. people got to listen to it twice. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> From the mind of Nikki G. Hey, this is Nikki G, and I just got back from the all-wheel drive fest, where I spent the entire weekend amongst the Hondas and the Subarus. <laughs> I had a great time. Everything was going great, all up until the point where my Jeep decided to make itself a three-link front suspension. Yeah, I snapped off a lower control arm mount. And the worst part was, uh, after limping it back to camp, all the jokes I got from the bougie Subaru crowd... <laughs> The one that hurt the most is when somebody yelled out, who had control arm for XJ breakdown bingo? <laughs> yeah, it hurts being the butt of all the jokes. But that's not why I'm calling. I'm calling to tell you I just sold a lawnmower on Facebook Marketplace. Yeah, that's the last time my neighbor wakes me up early on the weekends. <laughs> all right, boys and girls, I'll chat to you later. Have a good one. Bye. Yeah, well, ask those Subaru people, uh, did they make three million of that vehicle? Because they made three million of these. Nikki G has a, 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 a XJ. That's how I know uh, Nikki G from way back uh, from the, the XJTalk.com forum days. So Nikki G's been a, uh, around uh, XJ and the Jeep Talk Show for a very, very long time. Yep. A staple. Yep. Uh, and uh, coming up on our next interview episode, we're going to be talking with Tony Pellegrino about Genrite at Genrite.com. Uh, Larry, are you familiar with Tony Pellegrino and, uh, and, and all the things that he does? Very much so. It was a really fun interview. And I think I mentioned this already, but I'm going to mention it again. The very first question I asked in the interview uh, was, uh, are you moving out of California? <laughs> it was an interesting yeah, yeah. answer. Yeah. You know, that guy has a wealth of knowledge, too. Oh, wait. Not, o- not so. only just you just want to talk Jeeps, but also if you want to talk Ultra 4. I mean, the guy lives it every day, so he's a wealth of knowledge. Mm-hmm. And another question I asked him, I don't, I don't want to uh, uh, <laughs> spoiler alert the whole interview here. I asked him if he's going to start making Bronco parts. That was another great answer. <laughs> he, he is a Jeeper through and through. Unless they're very profitable. Jeep Talk Show. Yeah. Hey, it's me, here in Utah. I just got finished listening to episode 912. Oh, he's moving and, along. Uh, I love the I love the roundtable, and I'd love to be able to be a part of it. It's just not in my schedule. Um, but anyway, uh, YouTube, yeah, listen to all of them. Watch every mechanic there is. Take the dumb ones there. Take the smart ones. Put them all together. Rattle them up. You'll get something. You'll figure it out. And uh, uh, the yellow banana. I love watching that car go up the road. Honk the horn every time I see it when I'm down there in the big truck. And uh, yeah, Charlie Recon. Met him one time at the station. The truck stopped there delivering. Uh, come over, and I, I don't think he liked me too much, or the camera crew didn't or something. Maybe I was a little too intimidating because I thought we were buddies or something, and I guess people told me I'm kind of intimidating. I, I, I'm not big and scary. 
I may look like it, but I'm not. Anyway, keep up the show, man. Love you guys. DR has been mistaken for Bigfoot. So I think that might be uh, <laughs> I think that might be the the problem with the intimidation. Please don't eat me. <laughs> he calls in a lot. He's a he's a loyal listener. That's for oh, sure. Oh, he has such a friendly voice. He just sounds like a friendly guy. Uh, I I just can't imagine. But yeah. Uh, so you know, uh, I think I've mentioned this before, uh, Dr. But uh, and you've probably heard it if I have. But uh, I uh, I saw uh, I saw uh, Matt at uh, the EJS uh, the Moab Diner, and uh, I, I didn't see a situation where I was uh, I didn't want to the I didn't want that opportunity to pass. So even though he was sitting down at the uh, the table, I went over there and just very very briefly uh, inter- uh, actually I didn't introduce, my, introduce myself. I just said hey uh, I don't mean to bother you, but uh, just wanted to say hello. And uh, I never said who I was or who I was with. <laughs> <laughs> when I shook his hand, but he looked at me like, "Who the hell are you? And why are you bothering me?" I don't think it's. I don't think he actually feels that way. I think that's just his normal. You know how people are. They have a a normal uh, way of looking and stuff. Matt, uh, when we did the interview, super friendly guy. And uh, if I had uh, scheduled an appointment, or if uh, he wasn't busy trying to look at the menu, and he he may have been hungry. May, hell, maybe he was hangry. Uh, it, 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 I may not have seen that. The that somewhat of a scowl on his face. So I didn't take it personal. I wouldn't need it. And I'd advise you not to take it personal either. Thought you had his hash browns. <laughs> yeah. It's in this pocket. Go dive in. <clears throat> All right. So uh, anyway, get away from that one as, as quickly as we can. Must yeah. have stuff for your Jeep. It's Jeep stuff, Larry. It's okay. So uh, and Larry, I bet you've watched this YouTube channel. It's called Project Farm. And if you're like me, I never pay attention to the names of the channels. I just know when I see it or if I subscribe to it, it'll pop up more often. And uh, I'll, you know, just let YouTube do the thinking for me. Uh, but right. uh, so this is a guy that does a lot of testing. I mean, he, he'll test sockets. He'll test uh, electric uh, drills, electric wrenches. What am I saying? What is the, the, um, the, the power wrenches? What do you call it? The. Uh, the impact, uh, the electric impact okay. tools. Uh, I've seen all kinds of things, and he does a very good job of uh, scientifically, or at least uh, what appears to be so to me, uh, at least a fair comparison. And then he rates these things, so you don't have to. Anyway, uh, he I recently saw one about a uh, a power boost. So sometimes you know you, you, your battery's not working, or if you're in, in a modern day Jeep, uh, one of your two batteries isn't working, and you may need a little <laughs> boost uh, to get the uh, to get the the vehicle going so uh he uh, went through all the uh, the various power uh chargers that are out there and his results were the noco boost x gbx 155 4250a uh it's a 12 volt ultra safe portable lithium jump starter car battery booster pack usb c power bank charger and jumper cables uh for up to 10 liter gas and 8 liter diesel engines Good Lord, that's saying a yeah. lot. Especially for a diesel engine. Yeah, and uh, the, the the whole price on this thing is a bit pricey, but then again, it's gonna it probably will, will work when you need it. It's three hundred and sixty nine dollars and ninety five cents. And Larry, I don't know if you remember or not, but we actually uh, interviewed uh, the NoCo president several years ago. Uh, gosh, it must have been seven or eight years ago. Uh, whenever they were uh, really starting to push their product. And uh, I didn't know a lot about it. Uh, uh, we have one around here someplace. and uh, But uh, fortunately, we, d- we haven't had to use it. But I'm thinking that anytime you go on a trip, like maybe you're going to EJS, or uh, I think it's just a good idea to have someone like this. I, although I think it may be like a fire extinguisher uh, where you're more likely to use it for somebody else, or like your winch, you're more likely to use it on somebody else than yourself. Uh, but it's always great to have the tools, especially when other people don't have it. So we'll have uh, a link to this and also to a link to that YouTube video that I watched in the show notes for episode 916 from uh, just go over to jeeptalkshow.com to see all the information. Well, thanks for listening to this episode of the Jeep Talk Show. If you've enjoyed the show, please leave us a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform. Check us out on uh, uh, oh, I'm just brain farted, on Spotify. Uh, that's a great platform to listen to our show. Uh, and if you're a Patreon subscriber, you can actually listen to it in the Spotify app, uh, which makes it nice if you have multiple podcasts that you listen to. You can listen to it 
all in one place. You know, your feedback helps us improve the show reach uh, and help us helps us reach more Jeep enthusiasts like yourself. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media. Uh, Instagram is probably the best place to uh, keep up to date on all the stuff that we do. Uh, oh, and sign up for our email newsletter to stay up to date on the latest news, uh, Jeep news, and events and giveaways. JeepTalkShow.com slash contact. Finally, if you have any questions, comments, or ideas for future episodes, we'd love to hear from you. Just go to JeepTalkShow.com slash contact, and you'll find multiple ways to contact us. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you on the next episode of the Jeep Talk Show. Broadcasting since 2010.